Have you ever been reading the Bible and, and a story that you, or a place in the Bible that you've read a hundred times, and all of a sudden, the light comes on, and you say, I got it. I understand now. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? I had a couple of those this week where it's like, wait a minute. I've read this a thousand times, and, and it was like, oh, I get it. I get it. All things in God's time. I truly believe that there are times when we're not ready. We're just not ready to receive it the way God meant for us to have it. Not that he's hiding anything from us. It's just that he's dealing with us in a certain way. But then we come to that point in our life, and it comes to our point in our relationship with him, that he just flicks the switch, and all of a sudden, it's there. It's been there, but he's just, it's just now we're ready to receive it and understand it and to get it. But it, 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 it's just God's timing. It's great because that means he knows us. He really knows us individually and what we need and when we need it and how we need to receive that, which does he has. Who understands Melchizedek? Yeah. <laughs> And I remember when I finally, or at least I thought I understood Melchizedek and the whole premise around Melchizedek. And it was like, okay, I see where this is going. And I was sort of like, yeah, my chest went out a little bit because I understood. Then the next day, Byron was teaching us something, and I totally blew it out of the water there, so... So that was your fault. But uh, I love it when that light comes on. It's just, such, it's just so great when it happens. So anyway, it has nothing to do with what I was when we we're going, to going tonight. So please open your Bibles to the book of Genesis as we continue our look at the origin of sin and its outcome. Now, we ended last week looking at God's judgment on the sins of the serpent, Eve, and Adam. For the sake of his own character and law, God must judge sin. We all know that. But for the sake of his beloved son, God is willing to forgive sin. Remember, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so that God had already made provision for forgiveness and salvation. So we're going to pick it up right where we left off, verse 20. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now, up to verse 20, the woman has never been called Eve. We are so used to saying Adam and Eve that we assume she already had her name. But to this point, she was called a female, a helper comparable, a woman, and a wife. Now, this doesn't mean that God didn't have a name for Eve, but we are told what that name is in Genesis chapter 5, verse 2. Okay, he called them mankind. Genesis 5, 2 says, he created them male and female and blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. Verse 20 seems to have no connection with what has gone on before. It sort of stands apart, and so does verse 21. Verses 16 through 19 deal with God's judgment of Eve and Adam for their sins of eating the forbidden fruit. It follows the preceding verses nicely. In fact, every sequence of events and verses in chapters 1 through 3 is apparent until now. But now we read, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Well, if you remember, verse 19 is talking about how Adam will go through and with the sweat of his brow and toil the land and clean it up, and then all of a sudden, boom, this drops in there, okay? She would become the mother of all living. Just something you just pick up there. 
The idea that the woman takes her name from the husband and the idea that both genders are encompassed in terms like mankind, humanity, and chairman, our use of these terms is not merely cultural, but it's also biblical. It is said that, quote, a woman gains more of her identity from her husband than the man does from the wife. For this reason, women should take special care in which man they marry." End quote. Now, I kind of took that two ways. Either you want to make sure you marry a good and a good, wholesome man, a man of God that really loves the Lord, or you want to be careful you, you, you don't marry a man named Flashlamovitz or something like that, and you have this 17-letter name that you have to learn how to spell and, and write. Because she was the mother of all living, Adam named her Eve, even though she wasn't a mother up to this point. She, she wasn't even pregnant yet. Adam named her in faith, trusting God would bring forth a deliverer from the woman because God had said he would defeat Satan through the seed of the woman. We saw that in verse 15. Eve means living or life or life giver. Spurgeon wrote, quote, she was not a mother at all, but as the life was coming through her by virtue of the promised seed, Adam marks his full conviction of the truth of the promise, though at the time the woman had borne no children, end quote. There were no other people, just these two. All human beings belong to the family of Adam. That's why all are sinners and are in need, and are in need of, a, of salvation. Even though death was the penalty for sin, Adam and Eve didn't immediately die physically. So they could be fruitful and multiply as they were commanded. They certainly died spiritually and immediately when they sinned, but Adam didn't die physically until he was 930 years old. Even though their bodies would have started to die immediately when God pronounced the sentence of death upon the human race, do you, you understand that? I mean, up until this point, they're in the garden. Death is not an issue. But when they sin, the decay began physically in their bodies. Things changed. Even things internally changed for them. They began to die. In the next verse, we find the Lord God make garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothe them. The first physical death should have been the man and his wife, but it was an animal, a shadow of the reality that God would someday kill a substitute to redeem sinners. This is how God provides clothing for Adam and Eve after their feeble attempt to cover their nakedness and their shame. It's his way of demonstrating that he acknowledges their act of faith in verse 20. The word for skins presupposes the death of an animal, and therefore the idea of blood sacrifice is clearly implied. God loved Adam and Eve. The above scripture indicates the first animal was sacrificed for man. God himself provided the sacrifice, as he did with Abraham when he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac. God provided the sacrifice as God's concern was still the needs of mankind. Again, Spurgeon writes, quote, some creature had to die in order to provide them with garments. And you know who it is that died in order that we might be robed in his spotless righteousness. The Lamb of God has made for us a garment which covers our nakedness so that we are not afraid to stand even before the bar of God, end quote. David Guzik writes this, quote, there are only two religions. There's the religion of fig leaves and there's the religion of God's perfect provision through Jesus. Covering ourselves with our good works, I'm sorry, covering ourselves with our good works is like Adam and Eve trying to cover themselves with fig leaves. Our good works are like monopoly money, great for monopoly, but not legal tender. Your good works are essential to what it is to, 
what it takes to live out your life, but they are not legal tender before God, end quote. Adam and Eve were clothed with a garment that was purchased with the life of another. We are clothed with a garment of righteousness that was purchased with the life of another, Jesus Christ. Continuing on, verse 22. Give a quick sip here. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, at, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So God had, we know that God had placed two special trees in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. They were real trees, but each had a symbolic meaning. If Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would die, right? We know that. That was God's command. It wasn't the fruit that caused them to die, but the fact is they disobeyed God, and God had decreed that if they ate of this tree, they would die. So God, who never goes back on his word, judged them with death. God had declared Decreed, I'm sorry, God had decreed that the other special tree was the tree of life. And I don't believe that there was anything magical about the fruit of the tree if someone ate of it and enabled them to live forever. But because God had said this was the tree of life, if Adam and Eve had access to it, then they would be able to live forever. It was the fact that God said it that it was going to happen. But God didn't want them to live forever in this sinful state. So he denied them access to this tree by driving Adam and Eve out of the garden. Now, instead of looking after the garden, which provided fruit for them to nourish their bodies, they would have to work hard to till the ground and to get it to yield food for them. They and their descendants would have, would have to face up to what sin had done to them and to their relationship with God and to the world. This must have greatly saddened Adam and Eve but they must have also been encouraged that God had promised a savior. When God banned us from paradise on earth, living in the garden with access to the tree of life, he was being merciful to us, merciful to us so we wouldn't live forever in that miserable, sinful state separated from God. He wants us to be with him in heaven, which is a paradise without sin. Now, verse 23 to 24 says that God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden and had angels, specifically cherubims, guarding the way with a flaming sword to stop anyone from getting back into the garden. In scripture, cherubims are always closely associated with the throne of God. So maybe there was a special presence of God at that place. Later, we read about the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle in the temple having sculptures of cherubims over the mercy seat. This was where blood was sprinkled by the high priest once a year to atone for sin. What a reminder that the only way back to a perfect relationship with God is through the shedding of blood. In other words, the only way we can have access to the tree of life is through what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. Hebrews 9.22 says this, and according to the law, one man, one may also say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, we also read about the tree of life in Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse 1 says this, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So, the tree of life grows in the New Jerusalem, the city 
called the city of God. And only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be allowed to have access to it. Now I have a question for you guys. Have you ever wondered, and this is how my mind works, what happened to the Garden of Eden? Is that what happened to it? David Guzzi has an interesting theory concerning what may have happened. Quote, he says, this is the last historical mention of the Garden of Eden in the Bible. We can speculate that God didn't destroy it, but left it to the effects of the curse and suppose it that it gradually deteriorated from its original condition, blending into the surrounding geography, end quote. Kind of goes along with what you said with the, with the curse. Now we move on to chapter 4 and the story of Cain and Abel. Whereas chapter 2 and 3 recount the life of Adam and Eve inside the garden, chapter 4 will relate a new episode in the ongoing story of the first couple's experience, but now outside of the garden. Under normal circumstances, parents expect great things from their children. They want them to be wise and handsome or beautiful, filled with grace, love, and successful. In some cases, they look to their children to live out their own more limited successes or overcome their failures. For us men, we always hope our sons look like us, except for us ugly guys. Then we pray that they look like their moms. We pray that they will have more common sense than their putting headed dads had when they were growing up. I certainly hope my son has more than that. We hope that our sons will be tough and handsome and real men's men. If it's a girl, we hope that she will be as beautiful as her mom with just as much wisdom as her mother. But most of all, we hope that whether it's a boy or a girl, we pray that our children would have a love for the Lord. Third John 1 John 1.4 says, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in truth. In one form or another, every parent has that hope for his or her child. But in the whole history of the human race, there was never been a greater measure of hope for any child than the hope of Adam and Eve had at the birth of their first child, Cain. Listen to this from one commentator's introduction to chapter 4. Quote, All the world is a stage, and all the men and women merely players, wrote Shakespeare. They all have their exits and their entrances, and one, man, and one man in his time plays many parts. Remember those familiar words from English Lit 101? Shakespeare was right. We have many roles to play in life, as from time to time we relate to various people and confront different circumstances. The important thing is that we let God write the script, choose the cast, direct the action. If we disregard him and try to produce the drama ourselves, the story will have a tragic ending. That's what ruined Cain, the first human baby born on stage of planet Earth. He ignored God's script, did his own thing, and made a mess out of it. Genesis chapter 4 focuses the spotlight on Cain. He's mentioned 13 times, and seven times Abel is, identif as I, is identified as his brother. As you consider Cain's life and some of the roles he played, you will better understand how important it is for us to know God and to do his will, end quote. Tonight, we will see how quickly sin can spread because the heart, man, because the heart of man is evil. It truly is a picture of man who is in rebellion against God. But thank God for sending his son, Jesus Christ, to pay in full the penalty for our sins. With that serving as our introduction, let's go ahead and get into chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now the man had relations with his wife, Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she, and she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. God commanded our first parents to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and they observed this mandate. 
Here in verse 1, we have a, first, a few firsts. The first specific mention of sex in the Bible. And it appears that this is the first child Eve conceived in the first birth. Eve was obviously excited about this male child. Maybe she even thought he would be the deliverer. Maybe she was just expressing excitement that she could procreate as God had commanded. Boyce writes, quote, Eve held in her arms the one whom both she and Adam thought was the deliverer. How delighted they were. They didn't know that they actually held in their arms a little murderer and that the tragic history of the human race written in blood had begun, end quote. The name Cain basically meant, I've got him, or here he is. It's an interesting thing that we have to consider with the pregnancy of Eve and the birth of Cain. For instance, what was going on through Adam and Eve's mind when they noticed Eve beginning to gain weight? It wasn't like they could go to visit their doctor and get a diagnosis of pregnancy. What was prenatal care like for Eve with her first child? Was Eve still doing the same things she was doing before she realized she was with a child? Was Adam still making Eve keep the cave clean and her chores done right up until the birth? Ladies, who gave Eve her baby shower? When Eve went into labor, what was Adam's response? Did he run around gathering stuff ready for the trip to the hospital? Did he start boiling water? Was Adam pacing the floor up and down in anticipation of the birth of his son? And who delivered Cain? I know I'm being silly. Because we know, of course, that this was all in the hands of God. It was a different time and world, and more importantly, we know that God still loved Adam and Eve and that he was still there, was still with them. Eve praised God for his help with her first pregnancy. She said in our, in our verse, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. God was her obstetrician. She again bears his brother. Now some think the boys may have been twins since no time elements intervenes between verses one and two. I had never thought about that. Anybody else saw, see, ever see that? Her next son's name was Abel, which means nothing or empty or vanity. He was a keeper of sheep. Notice that Cain and Abel were not hunter-gatherers or cavemen as they grew up, Cain's profession dealt with agriculture and Abel's profession was with livestock. So that whole picture that we see in cartoons about running around with clubs and socking the, the dinosaur over their head, it doesn't stand up to scripture, okay? But nothing was, nothing was wrong with the professions they were involved in, even though some people like to make a big deal out of this. Both these laborers were just part of the curse, working hard for a living. Moving on, verse 3 says, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat, of their fat portion. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. So, of course, the big question is, why was Cain's offering rejected? One suggestion is that Cain's offering was not a blood sacrifice, which is required for atonement, the forgiveness of sin. It is true that God gave the Israelites instructions for grain offerings, but those offerings had nothing to do with remission of sins. From reading Leviticus chapter 2 and other passages, it appears the main purpose of grain offerings was for worship and acknowledgement of God's provision of life and of the various needs of the Israelites. In other words, such offerings were to give praise to God for his supply of, of their daily bread. The grain offerings were certainly were not for atonement. The writer to the Hebrews clearly explains why the offering of Abel was accepted and the offering of Cain was rejected. 
By faith, Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Cain's offering was the effort of dead, uh, dead religion, while Abel's offering was made in faith in the desire to worship God in spirit and in truth. This shows Abel's offering was extra special. The fat of the animal was prized as its luxury and was to be given to God when the animal was sacrificed and the burning of fat in sacrifices before God is called a sweet aroma to the Lord. You can see that in Leviticus 17, 6. The offering of Cain was no doubt more aesthetically pleasing. Abel would have been a, um, and Abel's would have been a bloody mess. But God was more concerned with faith in the heart than with aesthetic beauty. Here it was one lamb for one man. Later at the Passover, it will be one lamb for one family. Then at the atonement, day of atonement, it will be one lamb for the nation. And finally with Jesus, there was one lamb who took away the sins of the whole world. Of the many things about Genesis that trouble modern people, the acceptance of Abel's offering and the rejection of Cain's is high on the list. This question I get so many times at the jail. That and what happened to the dinosaurs? Because it seems unfair and irrational. After all, Cain did the best he could, some would argue. He gave what he had. Why should his offering be um, judged inferior to Abel's, others might say. In fact, if a choice must be made, why shouldn't Cain's beautiful offering of fruit be judged even more acceptable than Abel's bloody sacrifice? Abel went out of his way to please God, which meant he had faith in God, whereas Cain's was simply discharging a duty Abel's actions were righteous, whereas Cain's were evil. These two type of people we still see today. Cain's lack of faith shows up in his response to God's rejection of his offering of fruit. Rather than being concerned about fixing the situation and pleasing God, he was very angry. Cain's anger was undoubtedly rooted in pride. He couldn't bear that his brother was accepted before God and he was not. Hebrews 11.4 gives us some insight into what is going on here. We are told, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained, wit obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and through it, he being dead still speaks, end quote. In other words, Abel's sacrifice was done out of love to please God, while Cain's was done out of duty. There was a lack of love. Abel had faith, Cain did not. Again, Paul tells us in Hebrews 11:6, but without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When God clothed Adam and Eve with the skins of animals, perhaps he taught them about sacrifice and the shedding of blood, and they would have passed this truth along to their children. True worship is something we must learn from God himself, for he alone has the right to lay down the rules for approaching him and pleasing him in worship. Now, how did they know that Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God and Cain's were rejected? Well, it could be that fire came down from heaven and consumed Abel's sacrifice while Cain's just sat there. We do see that in scripture. Remember Elijah's encounter with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? He challenged them to see whose God would accept their sacrifice. Now, here's something that I found interesting. Because of Cain's disobedience and his consonance fell, he was depressed. His pride was hurt. He was angry, and it affected his whole life. Could it be that some people are depressed because they are disobedient to God, doing their own thing, and it just doesn't help? Are you miserable? That was Cain. I like what David said in Psalm 42, 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, 
for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God, end quote. What lifted David's spirit? The Lord did. And he focused back on him, lived in obedience to him. So we should be careful to keep our focus on Jesus, amen? It's as Jeremiah tells us in Lamentations 3, verse 40. Quote, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord and let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven, end quote. Examine your heart. Look at your actions. And if they are wrong, repent and return to the Lord because as you do it, it will lift up your countenance. One last point, and this deals with worship, which really ties this all together. And keep in mind that worship is more than just singing. It's a way of life. Paul put it this way in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, end quote. Our lives should be lived in such a way that it is our spiritual worship unto the Lord as we give our lives to him to be used as he sees fit. And here's the key. Listen to what Jesus said in John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. In other words, you must be saved for God to accept your worship in spirit, and it must be according to God's word in truth. If it is not, then God will not accept it. Abel's sacrifice was accepted because it was done in faith according to God's word. Cain's was not. It was rejected because it was done according to his own idea and efforts. His heart was not right with God. One commentator wrote, quote, it's a very dangerous thing to get angry with God. God does not have to explain the reasons for the things that he does. We just have to comply with his wishes. Cain was not just angry with God, he was jealous of his brother. His jealousy drove him to commit another more serious sin. It is dangerous to harbor jealousy. It generally leads to additional sin, even now, end quote. And we all know that's true. We've been there. Continuing on, verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fell, fallen? If you do well, will, you not, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and desire is for you, but you must master it. That's powerful. God approached Cain in love and offered him a chance to correct his mistake. Again, God asked convicting questions. He made no accusations. Sin is crouching at your door, it says. Sin is like a wild animal about to pounce on its prey. If not dealt with, sin will wreak havoc and destroy your life. God gave Cain the opportunity to do well. That is, to make right, the right kind of sacrifice with the right heart attitude. He then warned Cain that an offering of good works would not be accepted. Cain need not be angry. The fault was not outside of himself, as if it were something that, he, that couldn't be changed. It could be changed, and the one to change it was Cain. So too with us. We tend to blame others for our troubles. Although others are sometimes a factor, the true cause is seldom there. It is within. It is as Pogo said in one of his memorable utterances, we have met the enemy and he is us. God judges the heart. He saw that Cain's heart was full of sin, jealousy, and even murder. God would not require something that was impossible to do. Cain was trying to take a shortcut. He offered what was easy to acquire and what cost him very little. Cain brought an offering of his choice rather than an offering that would please God. So many times we choose to do it our own way and not the way God has called us to do it. This may work at Burger King. They may let you do it your way, as the commercial says, but God will not. 
As someone has said, quote, you can go to heaven God's way or you can go to hell any way you please, end quote. When we fall on our faces in failure, we want to blame anyone or anything except ourselves for our failure. God has a perfect plan, and we're not happy until we fit into that plan. God even mentions to Cain that Cain was the firstborn and would actually rule over his brother if Cain would straighten up and do what was right. God reminded him that he was plotting in his, own, in his heart a terrible sin. We can't separate our relationship with God from our relationship with our brothers and sisters. That includes our natural brothers and sisters as well as our brothers and sisters in Christ. An unforgiving spirit such as possessed canes hinders worship, destroys our fellowship with God and God's people. An unforgiving spirit is hell for the one who is holding on to that spirit. It is better that we interrupt our worship and get right with a brother than to pollute, pollute our sacrifice because we have a bad spirit within us. We continue on, verse 8. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. So here we have another first. The first murder in scripture. Cain rejected the wisdom spoken to him by God himself, rejected doing well, refused to repent, and thus crouching sin pounced and turned him into a killer. Cain's anger had already been noted in verses 5 and 6, and now in a fit of anger, he murders Abel. No human had ever died or been killed before, but Cain saw how animals were being killed for sacrifice, so he just practiced that on his brother, Abel. So begins the long history of human violence and man's inhumanity to man. This murder also had to be a heartbreaking reminder to Adam and Eve that the consequences of sin is death. Cain's jealousy had now come to produce a terrible sin. When they were alone, Cain killed Abel. This terrible sin is prominent in families even to this day. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 says this, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Statistics tell us that 25% of murders, or one out of four murders, are committed by members of the family, in fact, the immediate family. Brothers are very seldom alike, and jealousy springs up many times when parents show a special love for one over the other. There is never a reason to murder. Killing in war or to defend yourself is not murder. Jesus said that when you hate your brother that you have committed murder already in your heart. If we, if we were to speak in modern language terminology, we would not be able to claim that Cain was guilty only of negligent homicide or second degree murder or any other category that might lessen the offense. This was absolutely premeditated murder, murder in the first degree, Murder one. He was guilty. Let's move on. Verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now we know that God knew the answer to this question. He asked Cain because he wanted to give him the opportunity to confess his sin and start to do right after having done wrong. Cain's insolence and arrogance are evident in his offhand response to God's question. How futile it was for Cain to lie to God. It was madness for him to think that God didn't know where Abel was or that he could actually hide his sin from God. 
This reply of Cain is famous. I've heard it many times in lessons in school. The fact of the matter is that he was supposed to be his brother's keeper, but was instead his brother's murderer, and he murdered him for the lowest of reasons. Abel had not injured Cain in any way. Cain's murderous rage was inspired purely by spiritual jealousy. Spurgeon was shocked at the way Cain replied to God. He said, quote, the cool impudence of Cain is an, an indication of the state of heart which led up this murder and murdering his brother. And it was also a part of the result of his having committed that terrible crime. He would not have proceeded to the cruel deed of bloodshed if he had not first cast off the fear of God and been ready to defy his maker, end quote. Jude 11 warns of the way of Cain, which is unbelief, empty religious, religious leading to jealousy, persecution of those truly godly, and murderous anger. There is no greater curse on the earth than empty, vain religion. Those who have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. Many are afraid of secular humanism and atheism, but dead religion sends more people to hell than anything else. Verse 10. He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength, strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And we'll talk about that next week. Pretty heavy story, huh? The product of sin and jealousy and hatred causes us to do some very wicked things. And we see it more and more in our world every day. The news is filled with it. And it all began way back then. Let's all stand. May God have mercy on us. May our hearts be right before God. May we have a forgiving spirit and be able to approach our brother or sister and talk things out and talk to them instead of holding aught in our heart towards one another. I love my family. And I always want to be able to be able to communicate and talk and take it to the Lord. Father God, thank you. Forgive us, Lord, when we do hold aught in our heart one against the other, Lord. Help us to do better, to live in accordance with your word. Father, I thank you for tonight and for those you've drawn here. Father, I pray you will see us safely home.